Ladies and gentlemen, welcome. Thank you so much for joining us for today's webinar. And the topic we're discussing is today is evolving the brand in the midst of anxiety and fear. Our moderator for tonight is Mr. Gilbert Manurakiza, the CEO of the Numa Group. Gilbert is a brand leadership expert, trainer, and scholar with a passion for helping brands grow their influence and impact in the community and markets that they serve. Through the Numa Group, which he co-founded in 2020, and steadily built it to become one of the Africa's fastest growing independent strategy, brand and communications consultancies. He works with Fortune 500 brands such as Johnson & Johnson, General Electric, ABSA Group, PLC, AstraZeneca as an influence strategist, media trainer, brand architect and communications expert. Our, our other speaker tonight is Mr. Sandeep Madan, the CEO of Scanad. He is a consumer marketing and influence specialist with over 24 years experience in managing brands across continents, building solid teams and fostering a winning culture. He has successfully run PNL positions over the last 14 years across India and Sub-Saharan Africa and several of his agency offices have been at the forefront in surpassing profit growth and providing creative excellence across which has been repeatedly recognized in various award shows in Africa. Our other speaker is Ms. Eva Muraya, the founder and chief executive officer of the BSD Group. She is an entrepreneur with 20 years experience in brand communications, expertise in brand repositioning and alignment, brand marketing and sustainability, capital markets communications, crisis communications, internal brand engagement, customer centricity, media relations, stakeholder management, corporate and product PR. She is a warrior through the Marketing Society of Kenya, a member of the Public Relations Society of Kenya, and multi-award recipient locally, regionally, and globally. She is also the current chairperson of Gender and Youth Sector Board in, in KEPSA, founder and immediate past chairman of the Kenya Association of Women Business Owners. Thank you all so much and welcome. Thank you, Tima, and uh, welcome everyone to this very exciting and I dare say value-adding session and the topic we're going to be covering and tackling is evolving the brand in the midst of fear and anxiety now you can tell that we have mavericks on this panel and we are going to really be looking into this topic with a laser sharp focus but when we talk about brand you know there are many definitions that you might hear out there but i just want to simplify it and say that you know the brand is what people think and feel about you your services your products or your organization so with that premise then we are talking about what people feel and we are talking about emotion we are talking about obviously things that are very fundamental to people now when you talk about emotion, you can't run away from how we function as human beings. And with this, I want to allude to how our brains are wired. Now, we have about 171 billion brain cells that every day are functioning to ensure that we meet about three categories of needs. The first category is survival. That's the most fundamental. We want to be able to survive. So when you're hungry, your brain alerts you and tells every system in the body, go and make sure that this person is fed. So there's a whole category of needs that we have to deal with for our physical and biological survival. Second category, connection and collaboration. Over millennia, hundreds of thousands of years, we have developed as a humanity, the ability to be able to connect in order to optimize our ability to survive. And the third category of fundamental missions that our brains have is to be able to push us forward towards a better state than what we are in today. So imagine what would happen if 
we didn't want to improve our mobility. There would be no cars. If we didn't want you know, uh, to cover our feet, there would be no shoes. We are always pushed by our innate selves through various mechanisms to move to the next level. And brands are part of that mix. But COVID-19 has come into the mix and it affects these three categories. One, it affects our physical survival because biologically it can kill you. Secondly, it's hampering our ability to physically connect, which is something that we relied on over centuries and millennia. Thirdly, it's very difficult right now for many of us to aspire or to even envision a better future for ourselves. This elicits in, our, in ourselves, in our brains specifically, a reaction of either anxiety or fear, generally uh, you know, described as a reaction of fear. Or I would actually put it in another way. It elicits a certain reaction. So that reaction might be fight, flight, or freeze. These are reactions we developed over the years in, you know, during millennia, especially when we lived in the forest and we would see threats coming and we would decide, do I fight this threat, this predator maybe, or do I freeze if it's a snake, maybe freezing is better, or do I run away? Guess what? We are seeing similar reactions today. There are some of us who are over shopping. That is, I guess, the fight, uh, the fight reaction. We have some of us who completely have no idea what to do. We are confused, we are depressed. That could be the freeze reaction. And then we have those of us who are fleeing. We are simply saying, this thing doesn't exist. I don't care. You know, I just want to go about my business. So in the wake of this, obviously this has very significant implications for the brand. And it's not happening in isolation. It's happening at a time when brands are going through a dynamic shift. And I would just like at this point to request Eva to give us, to just set the scene for us. Building on your vast experience, Eva, uh, particularly in brand building, can you set the scene for us uh, with an overview of the historical brand journey and where we find ourselves today in terms of the impact of, of COVID-19 on brand engagement? Over to you, Eva. Well, thank you, Gilbert, and good evening, everybody. Thank you, Capital Club, for um, inviting me to this very exciting um, discussion. That's a huge question um, because the history, um, you know, there, there, there is history in brand building, and perhaps um, that's exactly what your question is about. And then maybe bringing it home to where we find ourselves in this tension that you have very beautifully presented. I am reminded of growing up um, in the countryside as a young child, dutifully following behind my grandfather on uh, what was a big day in our family. Um, my grandfather had a farm and he had his uh, cows. And every so often, Okay, this is a child, I am probably seven years old, six years old. Um, every so often there would be this day that comes and my grandfather would have us follow after him because new cows had come to join the herd. So if I am thinking the journey of brand, throwback, new cows, cows commodity, then he'd have this big rod over a fiery furnace and then he would take that rod one cow after another and poke into it and to your earlier word fear flight fight the cow would charge away and after this whole thing maybe six or seven cows after we would then follow him back home and he would majestically pronounce that cow is now maria that cow is now Sophia. That cow is now Margaret. So branding has its genesis. If I was to think, where did we really begin? In my mind as a practitioner, I am thinking my socialization, and perhaps that is true, the differentiation of commodity versus brand could 
easily have begun with, you know, making sure that the horse became some other thing other than horse. First phase. Into second phase, where we would then maybe define brand around a logo. The identity, an emblem would be what we would call a brand without much commitment really in keeping whatever it, it, it represented. The era where brand was an isolated role in the marketing department. It belonged somewhere at the bottom of the, of the you know, at the end of the, of the corridor would be the, the, the marketing office. So brand somehow resided there. Um, and then uh, the era in which the brand was a very tactical engagement, not much was invested in it. A one-way communication, you tell them it's product driven. They do the thing that we are um, telling them to do. Um, and, and, you know, we also, in that same era, brands were really created around a boardroom table. This is what it's going to be. We are saying it will be this. Metrics were inconceivable. You couldn't quite um, um, live up to the finance director because as your, your marketing um, uh, persuasion, you, you really didn't even know how to engage at that level. Um, and then um, perhaps the whole um, idea of mass marketing you know, all of you, this is it, come take it, phase two. Then we moved into a different era. We got into an era of the internet of things. Here, consumers now were a lot more inundated with messaging. Um, they, they are, there's, a connected, there's a connectedness. We have tribal communities showing up online. Um, there's targeted engagement at a brand level. And then we began to demand as consumers that your brand needs to mean something. So, so, so we begin to move in the science of, of brand building. Um, effective brand communication uh, became a lot more integrated with a, with a larger appetite moving us online. Um, the responsibility of organizational brand moved from the bottom of the corridor further upstairs into the corner office so that the CEO now began to understand that he must live breathe and drive the brand responsibility for the organization. Then a very important other science that there must be co-creation of brand value with our stakeholder community, that we're not policing and that we're not one tracked towards um, their understanding of brand. And then an interesting other philosophy um, called triple bottom line um, uh, brand building um, engagement, that it's beyond profit. It's got to be about our people, that our people are the ones that are the walking, talking billboards of the brand. And then of course, community engagement and discussions around sustainability. And then an interesting other phase, perhaps the phase just before COVID. And I will talk about it. In fact, a lot has been uh, written recently on, on this, this, the dynamics of, of the function. Um, we began to see a lot more alignment of sales and marketing. We began to see um, organizations invest and emphasize brand reputation as an important other element, customer segmentation, leading towards, you know, one kind of solution. Um, Amazon is a good, good example that I am everything you ever wanted, for example. My telco seems to be just about a telco company. It's my bank. It's my um, communication channel. It is my television. Uh, my bank began to give me investment advice. So that one-stop solution um, began to speak into what then brand becomes. Then leaning towards um, uh, data, that without data, we are sunk. What is the insight? And so we've seen a metamorphosis happen around um, the journey of brand building. And then we introduce this whole other paradox of COVID. And then we ask ourselves, where does this then leave us? As what is then the impact um, on that plus 50 plus 100 year journey? Consumer attitudes and uh, behaviors and purchasing habits, we've seen it live in Nairobi, we are seeing it um, um, globally. Uh, many new ways um, will even, in my opinion, remain post, post the pandemic. Um, purchases that have currently uh, been centered on basic needs. People are shopping a lot more consciously. So the whole way in which a consumer was behaving, at least in Kenya, before March 13, has radically changed. 
Um, there's another thing, and, and this was an interesting um, insight I picked from AC Nielsen. They, they published a report in March, and I remember in our office we discussed it quite a bit. There's a whole rebalancing of the M FMCG basket. What is going into that basket has really changed, and I've been observing. You go to the retail stores and you find that this change has happened. Um, there's a, there's an, a reset in terms of brand relationships. How I relate with my brand today is not what I was relating um, to it before. Um, Insula, I am buying local. I am for local. I suppose that has a lot to do with the disruption that we've had uh, with our global supply chains. Um, and then a whole thing about values. Is, is the brand you know, addressing my personal values? Is there a convergence? between the brand messages, the, the brand message that I am receiving with what I now begin to believe as a consumer within the, the, the COVID um, um, uh, situation. And then issues of wallet adjustment. So I think in a very long and winded way, that's my response to what's been the journey. We find ourselves in real tension and we need to really figure, that, figure out um, the journey forward. Wow, that's fantastic. Thanks so much, Eva. And that illustrates very well the point that brand is not static. Clearly, brand evolves over time. Some things or some factors, some contexts can trigger a faster evolution of the brand. Some elements might remain constant, like behavioral aspects. You were talking about how people are consuming different products. It could have something to do with their mental status. I, mentioned earlier, which, I mean, if I'm worried for my physical health, I'm probably going to try and consume something that addresses that issue before I think of getting a luxury version of that same product. So, so um, this is very interesting. And I'm, I'm very curious to hear from, from you, um, Sandeep, because you recently published a report. Your, your team at Scanner recently published a report analyzing the current brand landscape. And I believe that many of the elements in what um, Eva was saying are actually reflected in some of the insights in, in that report. Can you share with us some of these key insights and some of their implications? Thank you, Gilbert. Good evening, everyone. Uh, mm -hmm. I think Eva had uh, shared with us a fantastic journey. And uh, you know, the story of the cows being branded is actually how the branding began, the story of branding began. So she saw it live. So I don't want to hazard a guess on her age at all, at all. Um, I think let's, let's start with a startling fact. You know, in, in Kenya, before COVID, uh, there were about 8,300 people controlling about 82% of the wealth in the country. 8,300 people out of 47 million people or 48 million people in the country controlling 82% of the wealth. So even if you take an average household, which on a higher side of 20, it still is about 170 or 1,000 people out of 47 million people. Uh, so the income inequality has never been more stark than, than what we are witnessing now. So I, I believe that traditionally, you know, unprecedented situations have caused fundamental shifts in behavior and, and response therefore. So the report's intent that, that the team uh, put together was to really understand what is this new normal? Is, is it shifted so, so drastically? Uh, and if it has, what are the action points that, that we must have for brands and, and consumers? So what clearly started as a health crisis has, has uh, escalated to becoming a devastating economic uh, downturn, social disruption, business closures. Uh, I think it was a CBK governor who mentioned that nearly 80% of SMEs face closure, closures, unemployment all around. And an uncertain future is, is, uh, is a preoccupying uh, thought in almost every Kenyan's mind. If you look at the, uh, the key highlights of this report, uh, the GDP forecast has been brought down to 1% from 5.8%, uh, I think it was last year, 5.9%. 1%, uh, I mean, that's a massive shift. Our published, and I, I quote this, our published inflation is, uh, now 7%. Now, whether you, you debate it or not, I mean, it's still an increase of about 22% from just five months ago. 
84% of Kenyans are feeling an impact of this uh, uh, downturn through COVID. 73% are in financial uh, troubled situation. And only 26% are optimistic about a financial rebound. Now that's a, that's a massive consumer uh, mindset shift. We have had reported job losses of about nearly half a million. 54% uh, people in the country have received a salary cut and 75% are unable to service debts. Now these are staggering numbers and clearly they tell us that it's really tough out there. I think an increased uncertainty has triggered uh, or triggered uh, bulk buying because we didn't know the effect of supply chain. Uh, loss of income has also now led to rationing. So you see uh, 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 the supermarkets not to be full anymore or people not ordering, uh, uh, you know, and the mama boga on the road is facing the pinch as well. Now, you know, this has a, a spiral down effect. So, you know, it is the same pandemic across. So whether you are driving a Mercedes S-Class or uh, you're walking, it's the same pandemic for everyone. But it has a very different experience uh, for different audiences. So my team kind of put these audiences together as um, survivors, as middle and as top. And survivors are struggling with everyday survival. The Mama Boga, as I said, is struggling to make ends meet. Uh, the middle segment is fearing falling back or falling behind. You know, they're looking at uh, income slowdowns or income cuts and therefore you know, they have to uh, remodel their life. Uh, and the top segment is struggling with loss of lifestyle. They don't want to be locked in. I mean, you saw what happened uh, in most of these European nations and even US where they opened up and uh, you know, it, was, it was chaos. And everybody uh, rushing to have a party. I mean, we are coming out of a pandemic. I mean, we've not even come out of the pandemic and you're having a party, right? So uh, as we open up, the expectations are also very, very, very different. Uh, I believe it will be relief in the case of survivors, uh, reassurance in the case of middle income uh, group, and really release uh, in the top segment case. So, so that is where this, this report kind of outlines the, the differences, both in motivations uh, for the customers, uh, the, the reality on ground, and uh, therefore it should impact how the brands behave or talk to, uh, to the customers or to the consumers. Well, uh, Sandeep, some of those numbers are just staggering. Um, and they could be depressing, but uh, uh, I'm a pretty tough guy, so I, I'll take them and, and process them. But thank you so much for, for sharing uh, those insights. I can't help but notice um, these three different categories, uh, survivors, the middle segment, and the top. But I also remember that uh, you mentioned that this top segment is actually very, very small. It's a very small part of the Kenyan population. Uh, I think about 8,300 8, 8, 300 controlling 82% of the wealth in the nation. And this is staggering. And Eva, um, I think this highlights the challenge of extreme social inequalities that we have in the country. So COVID-19 is simply uh, highlighting the dangers of having such extreme inequalities. And I believe consumers are now looking for ways. In fact, some are saying that we need to fundamentally change the way brands approach what they do and the way economies are structured. Obviously, this is going to be looked at from different angles. But my question to you is, has the time come for brands, for businesses, to rethink their profit maximization strategies? Because clearly, and based on the numbers we've just heard from, from Sandeep, this situation might not be tenable, particularly during and post COVID. Thank you, Gilbert. And thanks, uh, Sandeep, for, um, for really being real on the numbers. How is that even allowed? That level of inequality. And I say that carefully because it's not just the privilege of Kenya to be showcasing those numbers. 
it is, I think, something that we will all agree applies across the world. We've seen agitation for the inequalities to be reversed over their heads, courtesy of COVID. So in some ways, COVID has visited on our societies to force a redirection on the unfairness of those numbers and that data, because what, how does it benefit the 8,000, I wrote it down, 8,300, if the pandemic, like Sandeep has made very clear to us, has affected all of us. The assets that are owned by the 8,300, with all due respect, would make very little beneficial sense within the reality of the pandemic. And this pandemic is left to move us into an unforeseen future that doesn't have a stop signal. So I think the first thing that we must do as businesses, as brands, is get to the place of absolute discomfort around this kind of information. Because even as we have observed, many of who are excluded out of this 8,300 that creates this iniquity are the pipeline through which we have generated the benefit of being 8,300. And that I am saying as a, as a metaphor. The response has got to be different. This is the consumer base. This is the community that we draw our employees from. This is the community that will champion our brands as advocates, as ambassadors. These are our vendors. These are our suppliers. We need them in order to drive and accelerate economic benefit. So issues of response, issues of a reset in terms of attitude and embrace, issues of a renewal of the way in which we engage, because surely the, the science that Sandeep has just shared with us must cause us some discomfort. And moving forward then, perhaps it's to begin to talk about how do we shrink the divide? How do we insulate our brand performance? How do we begin to recover revenue? How do we begin to rethink our business operations in light of the reality of this divide or separation in terms of income brackets? Rethinking the organization, perhaps even accelerating digital solutions so that they are part and parcel of how it is we will move business forward. But I think the main point here that I would like to register is that there has to be sufficient discomfort because this is not a correct dynamic to maintain. It is not a correct model because who's going to buy our product? Who's going to love our brand anyway? Who's going to drive the profitability if it is not this excluded community? So I think very quickly, that is how I would um, uh, respond to that, that it is the wrong way to continue. And the pandemic has forced us to come to the place of saying, let us now have candid conversations. Let our brands be a lot more authentic because the consumer's mind and behavior is saying, I want you to be truer to me. I want you to champion my well-being. I want you to be a lot more converged with my personal value system because something just flipped in the whole way in which I am engaging with your brand. Uh, so you said something, uh, Eva, and, and thank you for this, for this clarion call for discomfort. I, I think this is a very interesting call. Um, Sandeep, clearly, businesses and brands should have a certain level of discomfort. In your analysis, 
did you see a sufficient level of discomfort among brand leaders and the general leadership of the country? We see the government being at the forefront of the charge against COVID-19, but do you think we are seeing the level of involvement we should expect from corporate leaders and brand leaders? And perhaps should they have more discomfort uh, as Eva is, is calling for? So I think uh, uh, there is always a silver lining in every cloud, right? Um, so the good part of this pandemic is that it is the, a great equalizer as well. Uh, you know, so whether you're top, bottom, uh, middle, doesn't matter. You know, if it hits you, it hits you. Uh, we all will be on ventilator, you know, if required. You know, I hope the day doesn't come, but you know, uh, it, it doesn't matter. At the same time, uh, innovation most likely happens around uh, a, a calamity, around a tough situation. So you will find interesting, um, interesting efforts being made by individuals, corporates, brands, uh, which somehow can make uh, great strides in equalizing or normalizing some of these uh, inequalities as well as, um, as well as remove certain amount of discomfort. But I guess, uh, you know, it, it requires a lot of uh, effort, uh, which, you know, uh, I hope there are not enough marketing people on this, uh, Capital Club site, uh, which I guess my, many marketeers have shied away from. In you know, uh, most most marketeers have have found um, have found their purpose or redefined their purpose to be Marcom people, and therefore they're losing touch with what is a ground reality. They're getting stuck with a lot of these uh, guidelines, processes, and they're not really uh, connecting with uh, you know what's a ground reality. I think Unilever in, in Kenya made a startling change uh, from all their processes, all their guidelines, and I don't think there is any more uh, any other company in the world that has the amount of guidelines and the processes and the uh, you know uh, checks and balances like Unilever does. Mm -hmm. But within 14 days in Kenya, they created a new product line under a global brand name and created partnerships and distributed it. It was called uh, Lifebuoy Hand Sanitizer. And they did it within 14 days. To, for a global brand, for a global company to be able to do this in a country which is you know, not even a dot on, on their map uh, is, is just outstanding. And I think those are the kind of things that are uh, required to be done by, by brands for people. They did not do it for profit. I'm sure you really were losing money on, on that product because I don't think they've thought it through uh, from a profit chain but they've thought it through from a consumer chain. And I think they, uh, they, they've been hands down from a brand perspective in my view. You know, and that's where you know, the agencies, the partnerships used to reside. Uh, you know, when I started my career, and I'm sure Eva will, will uh, echo the same, same uh, point. When we started our careers, we used to be uh, engaged with our, with our clients in this manner where uh, it would not be about an, an ad. It would not be about an act. It will be about Commerce. I mean, I'm not able to sell cigarettes, or I'm not able to sell this, or I'm not able to, you know, uh, do this. So what do we do? Uh, the answer was never. I mean, it, it of course, being the business that we are in or the profession that we are in, uh, we will communicate. But the answer never started from I want a television commercial, or I want a radio ad, or I want an activation in this mall, uh, or I want to talk to this bottom of pyramid. You know, I hate that term, but uh, marketers uh, seem to love it for some reason. You know. Uh, we have classified human beings as bottom of pyramid, top of the pyramid, and you know, God knows which pyramid. But I think, I think that loss of focus has has really, uh, really impacted uh, marketing, has really impacted brand, has really impacted agency uh, uh, business as well. And I think uh, you know, just picking up from what Eva said about authenticity, mm -hmm. you know, a brand has to remain real to a situation. Uh, it needs to, of course, sell, but sell to me in in your authentic self. Don't try and create this platitude that uh, that I'm not interested in. I am struggling right now to make my ends meet. I don't have salary. I don't have food. I don't have, uh, you know, I'm worried about this uh, 
medical bill that may come my way, you know. Uh, but uh, and here you are trying to tell me a platitude that uh, this is how you should look at me. This is how you you know uh, you should feel about me. No, no, no. I I don't have time for feeling. I have I have to get food on the table for the children. I have to get education right. You know. Uh, what do I do? Uh, you know, when people lose one year of their ed education cycle. I mean, it is it is. I mean, I don't think anybody has thought through these these consumer challenges. And uh, I see a lot of these brand conversations, uh, which are happening around uh, developing communication. And uh, we, on the other hand, uh, you know, are, are trying to push brands to think about outcomes and start talking about uh, you know. Uh, addressing a, a real problem like bonga i mean bonga points for for food was an amazing idea i mean that 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 you know will remove a lot of the negative sentiment that you know people had about oh you're stealing my data you're doing this blah 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 they just go on for safaricom but just that one uh, effort i think has removed the uh, the whole uh, conversation from uh, you were to steal but here, here you are doing fantastic for me right mm -hmm. uh, you know, there's a global example of AI insurance, which which basically gave uh, COVID-19 cover free to all their customers without, uh, you know, even a question on their medical health. You are suffering, not suffering, doesn't matter. You are our customer. I mean, you have, you've taken uh, a life insurance with us. You are uh, hopefully healthy and living because you are living. You're not claiming uh, insurance from us. So here you go. We are going to cover you. Now, by the way, all uh, insurances cover you against death, right? In the unfortunate event that I may pass out. Uh, I'm covered of COVID-19 also, but here you go as a brand, you created a conversation that is addressing a real fear that I have. It is not talking platitude that, you know, if you are with us, you know, we will be with you all the way and, you know, all the other uh, happy smiley people uh, we see in, in most of this advertising. So, so I suppose that the, the challenge has been that are we real to the real situation out there or are we living in a cocooned world, insulated, and saying, okay, you know, I have to drive a brand love score, so I need to do ABC, which was the guide that I got from wherever global or or local uh, created guideline, and I must deliver against that. No, I think I think the time the time has changed completely, and I think the world has changed uh, forever. It is not now; it has changed forever. Yeah. Wow. That that's that's very interesting, and and it it rhymes very well with. Um, with what we've been, we've been seeing in a lot of the other research, whereby, for example, we hear, uh, we see more and more people preferring decisive action as opposed to those who are just doing nice things that look nice on video, but it doesn't sound authoritative and decisive enough because what people want right now is relevance. They want to know that you're relevant to their problems. And you've talked about if someone is is right now dealing with an existential threat of hunger, and you are coming here to try to do business as usual, certainly not only will they not buy into that, but they will be hostile towards you going forward. And an upstart or a competitor or someone who is not even uh, a front runner in your, in your sector, they will actually come and do what you're not doing and they will gain market share. And I think these are some of the points and discussions that should be taking place in boardrooms and executive teams that we don't see happening. I just want to tell everyone attending that we have, we are open for questions. You have a Q&A or a chat section on your Zoom uh, interface at the bottom. So you can send us any questions. And I just want to share a couple of two cents uh, based on some of the work that I have also uh, interacted with and some of the insights and research that we have seen. The first thing that we notice is this is a time to rethink the identity of a brand, if ever this is the time. I believe that every brand should be able to stand on a certain identity. Now, generally speaking, a brand is just bringing together people to produce products through processes that serve people. And I think at a certain level, big brands tend to lose the serving aspect. They, copy, they get caught up in the people, making sure that people are happy, getting as many products out of the way, having so much process, Sandeep, you've just mentioned that, but they forget the service part. They forget that at every moment you have to ask yourself, 
am I actually serving the communities that I set out in the beginning? And I think right now, the service question is the biggest question right now. Everyone is asking, who is serving me? And emotionally, we are going to respond to that. In fact, a study by MIT reported that uh, over 40% of shoppers in the US, this is not a local uh, study, but it could be um, interesting to, to look at it. Over 40% of respondents were saying that they are willing to try new products, particularly if these new products are more socially conscious. They are looking into the concerns of the people. So you've given examples, uh, Sandeep, of some of the brands that are doing some interesting things that are reacting quickly, and that uh, perhaps that could be uh, helping them even in the market and commercially. But when you look at it, they're not thinking commercially. They're first saying, let's serve, let's help. And then, you know, the, the, uh, the commercials will come later. So would you be ready to tell any CEO you meet tomorrow, sir or madam, um, let's not worry about the next quarter's performance, but let's do what's right for now. Uh, Eva, would you be a champion of saying, would you uh, risk losing business um, in such a conversation uh, tomorrow? I think it's more than risk to lose business. It's the sensible thing to do now. It is the absolute sensible thing to do now. In fact, it ought to be the only conversation we are having in our boardrooms. Because, like Sandeep has said, you can mine a good crisis like we are faced with right now. You have the opportunity to reconnect with your audiences. For truth, you can build authenticity around your brand. You can reposition, you can repurpose, and actually do so. So, in fact, the issue that marketers must now begin to deal with is moving brand beyond mindset. You know, the thing you talked about, freeze, flight, flight, into doing agile. It's beyond being to doing agile and making these innovations and making these recompositions of the brands, the brands offering its propositions, um, the difference it's making in the lives of its consumer audiences. If today my brand came to elevate a fear that I have, to give me a nestling, to give me a nurturing, to validate me, to tell me I am with you all the way in a tangible way. If my brand built memories with me now, they have me for a long time. If my brand made my community begin to get me perhaps access to water, I'm being now very practical, um, why wouldn't I buy their detergent, for example? If they gave me an access to generating some income because I was disrupted because of the current reality, why would I not choose to dispense some of that income in their favor? So they would begin to enjoy what they haven't done before. And so that conversation that I would be having with that CEO would be spun in a way that they can see the opportunity for brand growth, brand sustainability, and perhaps even brand retention beyond it being a threat on bottom line. It's a whole re-engineering because Many things have been wrong with the fabric that we currently exist. COVID has come to say, guys, I'm giving you a chance to reset, to reimagine, to repurpose. And brands must not be left out of that opportunity. It would be a big shame. But, but uh, so Sandy, building on that, if I were listening to Eva and I'm a CEO of a big Kenyan company, I would, and, you're, and I'm hearing this, I would ask, okay, but this is risky. We don't know what's happening tomorrow. Why do you want me to invest in an uncertain environment? How would you go 
you know, about advising, because essentially that's where many CEOs and expect, executives are today. We, we, are, we don't know what's happening tomorrow. So how, from a brand perspective, would you, would you go about guiding them on, 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 the, on the approach, on the framework, really? You see, the, the, the interesting part is even we don't know what's happening tomorrow. Right? So, so we are also alive to, uh, to this situation that it changes every day uh, in a, and takes a new head every day. Right? I was reading a report uh, on an announcement by WHO yesterday, and they said that uh, this pandemic is not even started in Africa yet, and it is about to start. And here we are trying to open the economy. We are doing the reverse. But anyways, you know, be that as it may, um, the, the reality is that uh, since we don't know and they don't know, uh, we have to take uh, some guidance from, uh, from history or uh, from certain situations that have been uh, created to, to handle a crisis not like this, but in, in some other context, like a game theory. So if the wind is blowing this way and you know that going this way is, is, is not the right way, then you have to go the other way. There is no choice. And there are many such examples in the world where uh, when you go, uh, when you do the right thing uh, by, the, by, by people and you don't look at them as your customers or your consumers and you look at them as people, as human beings, well, ultimately brands are nefarious, right? I mean, they, they, they are, they're not real. It's the product that is a real brand. It's just, it's just a name. It's just Sandeep. I mean, Sandeep is this human being, not the name, right? So, uh, but people will remember the name and associate it with, uh, with certain uh, actions, certain values, certain, uh, like, you know, Eva mentioned, like uh, with, with some memories. So what are those things that you are doing? And that's why I said it's actions, not acts. It is not ads. It is, it is real action. It is real tangible benefit that you are offering to me, that you're providing me, that I'm interested in. Otherwise, uh, otherwise it's, a, uh, it's a waste of money, uh, waste of time, and waste of a huge opportunity in the, in the face of this pandemic. It is the time to re-engage. It is the time to reconnect. It is the time to be real. Uh, enough of these platitudes. And, you know, uh, really, from from uh, a practitioner's point of view, it is incumbent upon us to be real about it. Uh, I keep telling my team, and I'm very uh, encouraged to hear the same sentiment from Eva that we have to be alive to the commerce of it in the real aspect, not the the platitudinal aspect. Wow, that, that's very interesting. And what you're saying, whatever he's saying, what we are what we would be recommending tomorrow if we were in a boardroom is essentially, it makes commercial sense to be human in this case and not just to be a brand or a business. It's, it's good to you know, take off that corporate hat and put on the human hat. Uh, in fact, there is data that shows that companies uh, in Japan, which is especially regions that are hardest hit by cyclones and, and earthquakes, tend to be quite resilient. And uh, you know, when they dug deeper, this, this was a Harvard analysis, a Harvard University analysis, when I, they actually dug deeper, they found that companies in those regions tend to do exactly what, you, what we are saying. During a crisis, they forget all the commercial considerations. They just ask, how can we be together and support these uh, communities? And after these crises, uh, earthquakes or any of these issues, they actually come out stronger because they have uh, very strong connections and emotional connections that help them to quickly bounce back after the challenges uh, have passed. So clearly this is a model that- I mean, Gilbert, if I may jump in, I, I want to give one interesting example to, the, to validate the point that you just made. Uh, yeah. You know, Japan tourism, Japan, Japanese as, as a culture, Japanese people, they have always liked to travel outside and not travel within the country. Uh, so Jap Japan Tourism Board decided to encourage Japanese people and residents of the country to experience more of Japan. They are taking 40% of, or up to 40% uh, of uh, the travel bill of an individual. Mm. Now, do you see what they have done? They have played the nationalist angle. They have said that we will take 40%, but imagine they were getting zero of uh, 100 right now, they're at least getting 60. 
So it is commerce, it is nationalist, it is driving the, the agenda for the brand to, uh, for, for its people. I mean, it was just fantastic and it fit in so perfectly. So um, on that note, I want to come back to you, Eva. Um, the brand uh, landscape is quite dynamic. There are many things happening um, now, and there is a lot of uncertainty going forward. If you were to give one or two pieces of advice to those who are attending and those who will watch the recording, uh, just a couple of things and cutting shots that you believe will be useful for them. Um, what would those be? Things that, that they could be able to relate to and, and perhaps uh, take forward in their everyday uh, business uh, endeavors. Thank you, Gilbert. Um, <clears throat> I think two things. One is that if our meeting rooms and our boardrooms are not asking two important questions, when did I last speak with my client, my customer, my stakeholder? And what did they last hear from, from me? What do they need to hear now? And have I understood their pain point, their absolute pain point? And how do I redefine the proposition I had from them, for them last time, that's pro-COVID pro or pre-COVID, pre-COVID to suit their situation now. And this is what we are saying with Sandeep that what, of what value is it to a brand if they don't have a consumer base because everything disappeared? You must make sure that your customer, your client is at the place where they remain dependent to the brand relationship that you invested in and that you must con continue to invest in in a differentiated way, in a consistent way, in a visible way, because you must create the awareness around how it is you are packaging that solution and in a way that is of shared value. So if I was to say a couple of things to any brand that I'm advising tomorrow is that you must get to the heart of the matter. This is not time for aesthetics and, and pictures and colors. This is a time for brands to drive a human face, to be empathetic, to move into the place where I'm hearing you beyond head and heart. I am hearing you beyond head and hand. I want to hear you into, in my heart. And it, whilst I've got you, Dear Mr. Customer, dear Mr. Consumer, dear Mr. Stakeholder, I will be speaking with you differentiated, consistently, meaning truthfully. I can't be schizophrenic in the way I'm speaking with you. And I will be visible, I will be articulate, and there will be shared value. So it's a thin balancing act for marketers, but I am sure that we've got professionals in this market who can rise to the occasion. I Fantastic. hope that that is helpful. Thank you. Definitely, uh, definitely to me sounds, sounds golden. And, and um, to you, Sandeep, uh, similar question, but with a twist. Um, you know, most companies, especially large companies are doing some of the things you pointed out, but we do know that we have a very, very vibrant SME space here in, in Kenya and in the, in the region. If you were, again, to give some nuggets of gold to these, um, uh, to these SMEs, and this actually is part of a question asked uh, by one of our viewers, what do you think SMEs can do um, to, one, to be part of the solution? Uh, two, um, what are some of the best practices you think they should be doing to stay relevant in the, in the float as brand, really? So it's really a two-pronged question. You see, um, there is a uh, there is a very brilliant thing that has happened with this pandemic. Uh, 
the the big brand space that used to be occupied with very large budgets with very strong uh, supply chains and, and stuff have all been hit so badly that most brands are suffering from stock outs right uh, because of the panic buying that that got triggered early in the in the game so what is happening uh, as a consequence is that i am depending on a lot of uh, local stuff on a lot of my uh, stores which are around me a very localized uh, thing because remember i don't want to travel too far i want to just you know uh, walk out drive out uh, you know ride out whatever you know in a, within a kilometer or so i should be able to access uh, everything and and that is a space that is the sme space in the report that we had published we had talked of the fact that small is the new big and i think smes can really occupy that space all that they need to do is is embrace technology for to find that equalizer now you have so many platforms today which which uh, provide that uh, that uh, opportunity there is a facebook shop there there is a, you know one of our platforms called gobi.shop there then there is a flutter wave out there then there is a shopify out there then there there are many 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 platforms that you know allow you to reach the customer in a very targeted manner and work with tech like a sendi or you know uh, glovos or yegos or whatever you know to to be able to uh, find a, a delivery mechanism what is missing however in in uh, most of sub saharan africa is there is there are many platforms where i can sell products like a jumia is there like you know uh, these marketplaces commerce e-commerce sites are there but there is no space where i can wear my skills uh, there is no skill marketplace so in fact that's one of the things that we are developing as as uh, as can i a skill marketplace which is based on a user rating review uh, which is backed by a financial uh, uh, platform which is uh, you know uh, kcb in our, in our case uh, and it is it is about marketing those skills you want a plumber you, you you've done your uh, tv training so so where do you market it currently is based on even you know uh, do you know somebody who can uh, you know be a great electrician who can you know, uh, fix my mobile everybody seems to have a guy but the guy doesn't seem to have enough guys so so the challenge is is in the latter so how do i therefore aggregate those guys uh, to find that guy who's who's brilliant who you are recommends right so Fantastic. so it, it it is a great equalizer and i think the time is right for smes to become uh, uh, become fairly significant players other than remain smes in the future Fantastic! Wow, that is just brilliant. Thank you so much, um, Eva. Thank you, Sandeep. We are unfortunately out of time. When we started, I knew this would feel like it's just five minutes, and indeed, it does feel like it has flown by so fast. So, uh, you have had uh, some very strong messages to brands. Brands, be present, be agile, be relevant, be focused, and most importantly, please be human. So. uh thank you everyone who attended i see we've had a question uh, we'll address the questions that we couldn't answer directly to you uh, we'll submit them uh, to the speakers and they'll be able to uh, address them thank you everyone thank you sandeep thank you eva uh, we stay in touch thank you stay safe you too stay safe everyone bye, bye. thank you for having us good bye. night good night